Hello, welcome everybody. I am so excited about today. My name is Joe Bita and thank you, Maddie, for such a great introduction. Uh, I am particularly excited about this event with DevOps Loop. I started my journey with VMware uh, almost three years ago now. And my first exposure was going to VMworld in Barcelona. It was in person at that point. And I was just floored with the sense of community and connection there. And what I'm so excited about is, you know, I'm coming from a different world with cloud, with a lot of the DevOps uh, uh, point of view. I really am so excited about events like this at VMworld that are really bringing these different communities together, getting to know each other and learning from each other. And so that is, you know, that is just great to see. Uh, what I'm here to talk about today is, you know, we have a couple of these terms, DevOps and cloud native. And um, both of them are, you know, the type of thing that you can go on Twitter and argue for hours about it. what exactly do these things mean? They're both really fuzzy concepts. And I think not only that, but the way that these intersect and layer and, and, and complement each other is something that I really want to go a little bit deeper on because I actually think that they're, you know, honestly two great tastes that taste great together. They're two concepts that can work very well together. So I want to start with, you know, these things are undefinable to some degree. I want to start with at least trying to, to work with my definition, at least sort of how I'm taking these things to begin with. Now, when it comes to DevOps, I grabbed the definition here from Wikipedia. Uh, uh, reasonable people will differ and, like I said, argue about this. And even some folks like Emily, who's going to be speaking next, have written books on the topic. But here's, and I think this is a decent uh, way to capture it from, from Wikipedia. It's a set of practices that combine development and IT operations to really shorten development cycles and provide high quality, continuous delivery of software. And so it's really about creating, in my mind, this connection between those writing the code and those running the code. And oftentimes, and I think this is one of the, 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 the key pieces here, is that this ends up being a blended role. Um, if we view these as different hats that people wear, oftentimes people will wear both hats at different times as they're doing their job. And so fundamentally, in my mind, DevOps starts with uh, uh, developers having to care and having to pay attention with how their stuff runs in production. And those who are managing the stuff in production, uh, again, it could be the same person, take the learnings from that experience and feed that back into the product to make that product more operational, more solid, more reliable over time. All right, let's get to my definition of uh, cloud native. Now, this is a little bit trickier. Um, it looks like maybe my video for us. No, there we go. Um, uh, this is my definition, and again, other people will differ here. Uh, I think cloud native is also a set of practices and tools, so very similar to DevOps in that way. But in my mind, it's about taking the best advantage of cloud-like systems. And for, for in this context, uh, cloud to me means self-service, uh, API-driven, and elastic. Uh, self-service, meaning that you can walk up, get your job done without having to talk to people. That ability to just get going is really critical. API-driven allows for automation. It means that there's a clear contract, and I think you know APIs fundamentally are a contract between those running the applications and those running the underlying platform. And elastic is the ability to be able to actually dynamically claim and, and release resources that allows new techniques in terms of being able to manage and, and drive applications. So those are the two sort of basic concepts that we're going to be working with here today. And I want to really dig into sort of how these things relate to each other. So yeah, so it's really about how do we bring these things together? How do they layer on top of each other? Now, a couple of things that are in common here. It's not just about tools. It's not just about software. It's about software and culture, those things really coming together. Uh, a common theme across these things is feedback loops. It's really about learning. It's about turning the crank faster, trying something, seeing if it works, and then reacting to that. And that the end result is be able to deliver real value to customers or to your end users in a much more fluid and uh, dynamic way. And fi fundamentally, it's really about taking different groups and creating a, a much more effective relationship between those groups, whether that's development and operations, again, could be the same people playing that, you know, playing that role, or whether it's between application teams and the underlying platform teams. Now, one thing I want to address here is that 
And I think this is something that as we've put together a lot of the folks that have come together to create VMware Tanzu is that people will say the developer. And in doing so, oftentimes they talk past each other. And I just want to recognize that the developer and the role of the developer is an evolving thing. Um, sometimes we're talking about the more traditional developer. Somebody sits in an IDE all, the, all day, writes business logic, and is somewhat insulated from the way that their code touches folks on the outside. Um, but there's this evolving role of a developer that really sort of rides that line between uh, infrastructure and application and really helps to create a lot of fluidity there. And oftentimes what you'll find is that on a development team, there will be a couple of folks that really end up going deep in terms of sweating the details around how that application performs, how that application runs on the underlying platform that it's running on. And that, I think, is an evolution of the role of what we mean by developer. Now, beyond that, I want to recognize that there's front-end developers, there's back-end developers, there's machine learning and AI, there's statistics, big data, uh, there's game developers, uh, you know, there's uh, uh, embedded, the mobile. I mean, there's what we're finding is that our world is getting so much more complex as we start seeing the role of what we mean by developer when we say it and how that evolves. And so really what this leads to me is that, like so many other disciplines, as things get more complicated, as we learn more, there's a real need for specialization. And I think what we find is that, hey, I'm a database person, I'm going to go deep onto databases. And then that splits into, are you writing new databases? Are you managing databases? Are you creating automation around databases? we end up with ever more specialized roles. This is both a good thing in that we can actually build a lot of discipline around these things, but it's also a challenge because what we find is that people get sort of tunnel vision around their thing that they're working on. And so part of what we need to do sometimes is step, step back, and that's what I'm trying to do with this talk, and say, okay, what are the different specialized roles? And then how do we imagine these things fitting together and how can we create good relationships between these things? And also recognizing that as an industry, we're still alighting on what exactly are the job definitions? What are the specializations? These things are still, actively being defined because our industry and what we do is so dynamic. Now, as we brought Pivotal into VMware, there was this phrase that was used a lot by the folks at Pivotal, and I really like it. It's this idea of platform as product. And this is one of the types of transformation that we see happening within enterprises. Now, if you're coming from the point of view where you know, you're a startup or you're working on cloud already, this is really not going to be news to you, right? The idea here is that as an application developer, as a person on an application team, my relationship with the underlying platform, I want to view that as a product, something with clear rules, clear contracts, clear expectations. And as I do so, that actually allows me to move faster because that means that I'm not dealing with bespoke interfaces. I'm not having meetings every time we want to push a new version of something. There's real clarity in terms of what I'm delivering. Now, that's not how it works in many enterprises. Many enterprises have essentially you know, a ticketing system with a human in the loop, and that really just slows things down. That's not cloud-like in the term of self-service and API-driven. And so what we really encourage platform teams to do is to, to create an attitude where they're delivering a product to their consumers. They're actually trying to create as much leverage, as many force multipliers as possible so that those application teams can move faster, create their own feedback loops, and be successful. And so a big part of cloud native on the side of those providing or curating the platforms is to really view that as an internal product that you're delivering to your application teams. And so that shift from service to product is a really important one to wrap your head around and is really fundamentally at the root of actually starting to create some of the efficiencies that we see with cloud native. Now, if there's one slide that you screen cap and actually you know, save or, or talk about, I think this one really, for me, captures really what's happening here. Um, I see DevOps as a fundamentally different axes 
than cloud native. I think these two things actually intersect with each other. Whereas DevOps is about improving the relationship between operators and developers. How do we actually create a more fluid relationship, build tools there so that we can actually cross that chasm? Cloud native is actually between platform and app. Um, how do we create essentially these efficiencies over systems like uh, uh, your infrastructure, but also looking at data systems and create efficiencies there so that you can have specialization expertise with a clean contract between the platform and those that are running the app. And what we find out of this is that you end up with one of these classic, you know, business slide four squares where we have these combinations of platform operators and platform developers and then app operators and app developers. Now, oftentimes in the enterprise setting, the things that we really focus on is what I would call the platform operator and the app developer. You have somebody who's, who's going through and helping to curate and present the platform and make sure that it's reliable and, you know, and, and running smoothly, that would be the platform operator. And then you have the role of somebody writing application code where they're going through and making the application, adding features. And then oftentimes it's a direct relationship. This is in, in traditional IT between the app developer and the platform operator. But with the advent of cloud native and DevOps, what we're actually starting to see is more specialization into these new roles, like the application operator or the platform developer. Now, the platform developer can be a vendor, somebody that you're working with who's driving your cloud or who you're buying software from. But oftentimes what we find is that you may bring in some folks to help out to, to, to evolve your platform, or you may have specialized roles within your organization to take a platform and then specialize, extend that to make it that much more effective for that organization. And so we're starting to see the advent of the platform developer as being something that is critical to creating those efficiencies and creating uh, the, you know, to really embrace these new cloud and DevOps systems within organizations. Now, on the other side, what we see is the emergence of the application operator. This ends up being and it's somebody who's fundamentally driven to make sure that the application is running well, but they're doing it just at the application. They interface oftentimes with the platform underneath them. Now, with certain platforms, we can have that application operator role shrink to the background and we can have developers take it on. For more complex applications, I'm thinking back to my history when I was at Google, looking at how we would run systems like say Gmail, that really becomes a pretty big specialized role to be able to manage that much application across a large footprint. And so that split there really makes sense. Now, I want to be clear, I think, you know, in this particular case, I think there's an observation around the difference between operator and developer. Um, a developer's success is judged by new features, new excitement, evolving the product, whether that be the platform or the application itself. From the operator point of view, success for an operator is when nobody notices what they're doing. It's the classic infrastructure, uh, uh, you know, when you do your job, nobody notices, right? And so I think that, you know, it's important to recognize that there's different focuses for each of these roles in terms of what they delve into, what they're good at, and how we judge success there. Now, when we see this working well, it starts to create a set of virtuous cycles. And this is really where things get exciting. What you find is that you have a platform team and they deliver a set of tools that can start to accelerate application teams. And again, they can be building them themselves. They can be taking something from a vendor like VMware. They can be working with a, a cloud. They take those efficiencies and they actually help to curate and present those to their application teams to make those application teams that much more successful. That starts things off. But just like DevOps, where we have to create a fluid relationship between these two roles, it's important that the platform teams and the application teams are able to work with each other to create this virtuous cycle and make things better. And so the platform team presents something, the application team starts building on top of it. Oftentimes the application operators will start building some tools and some extensions, maybe find something uh, in the community or find some other product that works for them. And then they'll roll that back into the platform. So oftentimes you'll see capabilities migrate from the application operator 
into the platform and you'll have the platform developer start to actually take that tool set and expose it to the rest of the organization and in so create inefficiencies. And so it starts creating this loop and this challenge where the application teams have ideas of, hey, wouldn't it be great if the platform did X? And then the platform team embraces that. They move things a little bit further. You find application teams starting to react and start to use those tools and learn. And that virtuous cycle, once you get that going, can be amazing in terms of creating ever more capabilities that really accelerate everything about your business. Now, with all of this, I want to address the idea of complexity. So much of what we do is we're adding new layers, new concepts, and this can be oftentimes very uncomfortable for folks who aren't used to this role. Uh, this can both be coming from the infrastructure side. I'm thinking about the VMware VI admin. There's a lot of new things going on in cloud with things like Kubernetes, with new versions and new tool sets and new ways to actually relate to your customers, to your application teams. That's intimidating and it's complex. From the application developer side, you know, hey, I just used to take my code and hand it off to somebody. Now I'm, I'm responsible for maybe actually starting to understand the capabilities, the pluses, the minuses, the strong points, the weak points of my underlying platforms and make sure that my application runs on top of that. That brings in new concepts that you have to learn, new things that you have to work with. Now, the first argument that I'm going to make here in terms of how to approach this type of complexity is that everything we do is fundamentally complex. None of this stuff is easy. Now, oftentimes what we find is that it's, we, you know, we've, we've learned it years ago and we've forgotten how hard it was. I think anybody looking at something like AWS today, anybody looking at Linux for the first time, there's an enormous amount of complexity there. But because it's so built into our roles and because we've been doing it for so long, oftentimes we don't see that complexity. Uh, it really becomes something that fades to the background. Now, when it comes to deployment systems and how you build and manage platforms, oftentimes what we find is that people build complex systems, but it's their systems that they've built over time that they understand. Uh, and so that's personal complexity. Now, oftentimes if we have off the shelf systems, if we have communities like Kubernetes, like all the other DevOps tools and the emerging set of cloud native tools, well, those things are probably just as complex but it's harder to learn because you're learning it all at once. Uh, but the plus side is that it's shared complexity, which means that you actually have a community of folks that you can work with. When you're looking to hire and bring people on board, it's likely that they have some exposure to these technologies before. And so to some degree, like what I want to say is that even though it may be more uncomfortable to work with, shared complexity, in my mind, is much preferred over personal complexity, because this is something that you can actually uh, work with and learn, and it ends up being something that sticks with you through your career as we actually work across different organizations and different situations. Now, the other aspect of complexity that I want to talk about is accidental versus essential complexity. Now, there are Con uh, 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 concepts and ideas that are absolutely essential to the problem being solved. And these things are just, it's part of our job. It's part of what we do. Now, this is not the same for everybody. I'll give you an example. Is that oftentimes configuring a load balancer is a really complex thing. Uh, you know, in the simple case, you want to go through and say, hey, I just want to go through and like, you know, have a route and have it go to these set of back ends, just make it happen. But what you find as you start looking at, hey, say doing blue green deployments or canarying some new things or doing some feature flags or dealing with you know, more global applications, load balancing starts to get really complex really fast. And so that those extra concepts end up being essential complexity for something like the load balancing problem, even if it doesn't you know, hit you on every single application that you're gonna be working with. Now, on the flip side here is accidental complexity. This is, these are things that, you know, you know, if we had perfect vision, you know, hindsight is 2020, we would go back and we would probably refactor, rethink things in a different way. But because of history and just because of the way these systems work and the sort of the inertia of the things that we're building, it's difficult to go through and remove that accidental complexity uh, after the fact. Um, one example that I'll give you is I'm not happy with Kubernetes. And for those who aren't aware, I uh, helped get the Kubernetes project started. Um, 
for those not aware, like I'm not super happy with the service interfaces and the, the, the load balancing interfaces in Kubernetes. I think we probably uh, created extra complexity by trying to oversimplify and pack everything into one object. There is an effort in upstream Kubernetes now called the Gateway API to refactor a bunch of this stuff and actually learn and eliminate a lot of that accidental complexity that we had with the service interfaces in Kubernetes. Now in doing so, we're introducing new concepts that are broken out explicitly. And so to some folks, it may actually look like an increase in complexity, but in my mind, that's essential complexity that we're working with there. So the key of anybody working with platforms, building platforms, is to try and boil things down to that essential complexity and work to make sure that you have the right abstraction and the right level of complexity that is absolutely necessary for the types of applications and the customers that you're going to be working with. Now, that's... Uh, 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 one of the things that I think is, is, is recognizing here is that getting from a more traditional approach to writing and shipping and, and, and uh, operating applications to the more dynamic world that we're seeing with cloud native approaches, really using the best of the underlying platforms and with DevOps, creating that more fluid experience between developers and, and operators, it's a long and difficult journey. And one of the things that I think I want everybody to be aware of, at least this is what I've seen, is that there is what I'm calling an uncanny valley in the middle, a place where things are just not quite right and it feels off. Now, for those not familiar, in the animation world, in the computer graphics world, the uncanny valley refers to the idea that if you have something that is clearly animated, clearly cartoonish, think Toy Story, Pixar films, that is comforting, we like it, it's great. Um, on the other side, if you have something that's so realistic that we have a hard time telling the difference between what we're looking at in the real world, that also doesn't actually make us feel uncomfortable. But what we find is that there's this sort of in-between where things are not cartoony enough to clearly be graphics, but also not realistic enough to really fool us. And that's what folks call the uncanny valley. And it's fundamentally really an uncomfortable thing to watch or uh, to experience. So if you've ever seen graphics where it's like, it's too real, but it just feels off, that's the uncanny valley. And I think there's something similar that happens with transformations. Um, Everybody has, you know, traditional IT, they'll ship, say, every three months, and they have a lot of processes to be able to do that. Oftentimes, those processes will be very manual, and that slows everybody down, but it's well understood, and folks really understand how to actually get software, and they've constructed teams and culture and processes around that, say, sort of two to three month ship cycle. Not uncommon. On the other hand, you see these high-performing teams that are able to ship you know, every day, multiple times a day uh, to really turn that crank fast. High performance, high uh, effective teams with continuous delivery and continuous integration. That's great. Somewhere in the middle is actually really, really difficult. Around sort of say shipping every two weeks, what you find is that you uh, haven't force yourself to create all the automation, all the efficiency, all this sort of fall forward trust that you need for continuous delivery. Uh, and you know, so you're, you're paying the price of doing a lot of these manual processes uh, uh, still at that two week boundary, but you're not reaping very many of the benefits in terms of being able to react really fast. And so my advice as you look to, to transition towards this more modern way of managing things is to push through that uncanny value and get yourself to the other side. Now, there's a book here that I want to actually call out, and I think this is, this is I, I, I love this book. Now, it doesn't cover DevOps in general. It covers sort of looking at the world, and it honestly reminds me of some really great classes that I took when I was in college. Uh, this is Thinking in Systems by uh, Donella Meadows. And generally what this does is it encourages you to look at the world and understand how does one system relate to another system? How do we think about the relationships between these things, feedback loops, flows of resources? And oftentimes, you know, this is in the physical world when we're actually talking about, you know, uh, car inventories is one of the big examples from the book. But we also think about electricity. We also think about uh, uh, things like plumbing. Now, 
first order, like as you're building distributed systems, whether you're operating these things or, or you know, wearing that operator hat or that a developer had, whether you're wearing the application or the platform hat, as you're building these distributed systems, what you find is that a lot of the concepts in this book apply directly to that. Uh, so when you're looking at control theory, you'll hear words like governor. Uh, and it turns out that Kubernetes is actually the root word for governor. And so there's, there's really a lot of in common across this world in terms of being able to model in your brain how these different aspects of your technical systems relate to each other. And so training your thought to under training your, your brain to understand and see those systems is actually an incredible power tool that applies both in our in the in the uh, the virtual uh, computer world, but also in the real world, uh, in physical systems. But beyond that, I actually think that when we look at groups of people working together, when we look at operations teams versus development teams, when we look at platform teams versus application teams, we are human systems. And we are human systems that relate to each other. And I think what I find is that some of the concepts that come from this thinking and system point of view also apply to the way that organizations work, also apply to the way that culture works. And so thinking about how do we model and build intuition about systems that apply across both physical systems, virtual systems into, into people systems is really, really interesting. And I think that intersection of technology and tools and people is really at the heart of both DevOps and cloud native. And these things don't operate independently. And I think that's one of the things that really comes through in the book is that systems rarely operate in isolation. So your technical systems and your people systems are intimately entwined with each other. So final thought I wanna leave you with here is that we're all learning this stuff together. Um, just like we had you know, no set definition of what DevOps and cloud native is, it's really something that people have to experience and understand. And, it, you know, and that's why we're having conferences like this. And so we can share knowledge and perspectives on these topics. Um, just because somebody like me stands up on stage and says, hey, this is what I'm seeing. Your reality is different. You're going to learn. So take everything that you're going to be seeing today in context of like, here's a toolbox that I can draw from. None of this stuff is easy. None of this stuff is automatic. And we all have to learn from each other to be able to do better and to make this entire thing work. Now, one final note, and this is a little bit of a forced transition here, but with that in mind, one of the things that we're doing as Tanzu, uh, VMware Tanzu, is we're releasing today this thing called Tanzu Community Edition. And I couldn't be more excited about this. This is really taking Tanzu and what we've been building and open sourcing it so that folks can start experiencing it and playing with it right now. Now, the reason we're doing this is number one is that we want people to be able to experience Tanzu and get to know what exactly it is that we are without having to talk to a salesperson, self-service, uh, <laughs> uh, or to actually enter a commercial agreement with us. We think that, that that's a great way for us to start uh, getting folks aware of what Tanzu is. But in the spirit of we're all learning together, we want to learn from understanding how people view this, how people see what we're doing, uh, where we're actually being effective in terms of thinking about these problems and where we're not. And so a big part of this for us is to actually create some of those learning loops so that we can learn from our users and we can turn those learnings back into a, uh, making a better product for us, which definitely helps us out, but also taking a lot of those learnings and bringing those into the upstream open source communities that we're working in. There's a lot going on here with Tanzu Community Edition. And honestly, we're just getting started. Uh, if you want to hear more, there's a talk uh, that Amanda and Josh are giving at 9 a.m. Pacific. That I believe that's noon Eastern. And so tune in for that. Uh, if you're watching the recording, you can skip ahead right now. And, uh, and really, uh, I want you to learn more about Tanzu Community Edition. Let us know what you think. Let, you, let us know what's good. Let us know what's bad. And we'll definitely hear that, take that, and we'll help make things better for everybody together.